everybody. Hi. So welcome to our panel. Um, if you're from New Haven or if you're from the US, you probably couldn't ignore what happened uh, last fall in terms of the outbreak of the Ebola epidemic uh, in Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. But if you're like me and you're in New Haven, a lot of the stories you heard were about names like Craig Spencer and Casey Hickox and Amber Vinson uh, and Thomas Eric Duncan. And you didn't hear about the stories that happened in Liberia and Sierra Leone and Guinea um, and about the epidemic in the countries where it mattered most, where thousands of people got sick and died. Um, and the genesis of this panel uh, was from Angelique Kijo, as you'd heard, uh, and Alex Ripp asked me to put this together. I worked in Southern Africa for a long time on health and human rights, and I, I'm not an expert in Ebola or on Sierra Leone, Guinea, or Liberia. And when I thought about how to put this panel together, I said, who do you want to listen to to learn more about these things? And I happen to have the uh, ability to read the works of Ashoka, Chenor, Adia, and Francisco, and thought, you know, they really put a perspective on the epidemic that I don't think many people in New Haven, Connecticut, or, or the US have really gotten a chance to hear. And, and the, the exercise today is to give you a chance to hear about what they've been thinking and what they've been writing, what they've been doing over the past uh, year and a half around the Ebola epidemic and around, around global health and health equity. Um, and so what we're gonna do for the format of this panel is to let them each speak for five, seven minutes or so to give, them, give you a sense of um, how they've sort of conceptualized and what they've thought and what they've been doing around uh, the Ebola epidemic to hear a little bit about where they're coming from, where they're, how their perspective has been sort of built to, to sort of craft the analyses that you're gonna hear, hear about. Um, we'll go through the panel, let them do their five to seven minutes. I'll ask a few questions so they can, if they'd like, interject and ask questions back and forth between each other. And then uh, probably for the last half hour or so, we will open it up to the floor and we'll, we'd ask you to go to these two mics um, when we're ready to open it up to the floor for questions. And so I think we'll just go down the, the, the line here in, in the order and I'll introduce people and give them a chance to talk. Um, our first speaker is Francisco Perez. Um, he graduated from Harvard in 2006 with a BA in Social Studies and Women in Gender and Sexuality Studies. Um, he's worked in Senegal for uh, an NGO called Tostan, which was an international human rights and literacy NGO. Um, he's also more recently worked as a program manager for Catholic Relief Services in Guinea when the Ebola epidemic uh, hit there. Um, he'll be going back to school to get a PhD in economics at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst in the fall. Um, and uh, without further ado, Francisco, give you a chance to sort of make some yes. opening comments. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. We're really glad to have you here. It's um, good to know that so many people are interested in such an important topic. Um, like Greg was saying, I worked for two years, the last two years, as a business development program manager with Catholic Relief Services. I was based in Freetown in Sierra Leone and covered Guinea and Liberia. And I was there for about a year when Ebola first sort of hit. So I kind of got to see the crisis unfold um, and then was, was subsequently had to be evacuated in August um, before going back in February of this year. So when I came home, I, I you know, was, was sort of just reflecting and I ended up writing my friend a, a long letter trying to, exp you know, just for myself trying to explain what happened. You know, how did this, how did this come to be? Um, and she encouraged me to publish it, which I did. And you know, in, in looking through, you know, what, you know, we obviously kind of know what happened in the immediate sense. There was an outbreak, the disease spread, people were caught off guard. Um, it, it had terrible consequences in terms of loss of human life and, and on people's livelihoods and, and, and just the social fabric and overall in these three countries. Um, but you know, I wanted to really look at what were the deeper issues? What was really going on here? What is, it, what is a sort of um, deep background to, to, that sets a sort of stage for, for something like this? And you know, identified kind of three um, major areas, obviously in, in, in reading you know, the, the work of the other panelists, you'll, there, there's, there's more to the topic, but I thought these three were specifically were very important. You know, the first one being you know, looking at why the public health system was so inadequate. You know, why was it that, you know, because Ebola is actually rather easy to contain. You know, you just need proper hygiene, proper control, and, and people were dying because they didn't have water and soap to wash their hands, they didn't have gloves, they didn't have caps and gowns, and other sort of basic protective equipment. And you know, you ask why that is, and you go back to, you know, all of these countries, uh, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea, have all had their, um, have basically been under tutelage by you know, the IMF and the World Bank for, for decades now. Uh, and, and they're often the ones who control the purse strings, right? So they're the ones who've decided 
who gets to spend how much money on healthcare. So if you look at a system where you don't have enough trained nurses, you don't have enough trained doctors and personnel, and you start looking at, well, why is that? You know, and you look at the sort of roles that these international organizations play in setting fiscal policy in these countries that don't really have the policy autonomy you know, necessary to build public health systems that are you know, worthy of the name. Um, you know, secondly, Ebola is a neglected tropical disease. You know, and, and once you're in, in places like Sierra Leone, you hear about other diseases that you know, no one, you know, when, when it first came out, we all thought it was a case of loss of fever, for example. Loss of fever is another sort of one of these diseases we don't hear about that tends to affect a lot of people. Um, but you know, pharmaceutical companies ignore these, these, these diseases because there's not money to be made there, right? So one of the things that we learned when Ebola hit was we don't actually know that much about Ebola. You know, we didn't really know where it came from, how it spread. You know, we, we, a lot of the initial information we received turned out to be wrong. You know, they told us that 90% of people had a 90% case fatality rate. You know, it was essentially a death sentence. And we have way more than 90% of people who've survived. You know, and, and part of it, we just, don't, we just didn't have the research on the different strains of disease, how to contain it. And, and we've seen since the response how, you know, now that it you know, became sort of made international headlines, now you see funds going toward vaccine development and, and vaccine trials. And you know, now all of a sudden people are willing to invest in this disease. And you know, it makes me wonder, you know, what, what, what will be the next sort of you know, outbreak that, that will finally motivate us to, to, to focus on that disease? Uh, and then finally, the one sort of thing that I feel like people weren't talking a lot about, which I thought was crucial to just how this whole unfolded, was the environmental impact of, of a lot of these development initiatives in these countries. You know, the fact is we, we are, because of mining and logging and uh, corporate agriculture and these sort of big palm oil and sugarcane plantations, cutting deeper and deeper into, the, into, into what used to be sort of virgin forests. And in a lot of places, there, there are even you know, cultural taboos against going into certain parts of, of, of the forest. And, and you, we've seen that whole sort of um, social and environmental ecological system kind of you know, be seriously threatened. And, and this is you know, how a lot of these diseases jump from animals to people is by us coming into increasing contact with them. You know, so now that it's, you know, I got a chance to go back in February and see that you know, it's not quite the dire situation I left behind in August, um, but the, you know, the, the outbreak is still not over. And I feel like we still have not addressed these sort of root causes. And whether it's Ebola or something else, we're likely to see you know, another epidemic that will just likely you know, to also cause needless suffering um, unless we start looking at you know, some, again, some of these bigger issues and, and thinking of how we can work with, with, uh, with activists and, and, and just concerned citizens in these places to um, you know, improve the situation in, in all three countries and, and throughout the region. So, thanks Francisco. Our next uh, panelist is Adia Benton. Adia is an assistant professor of anthropology at Brown University, and her research and teaching focuses on ideologies, cultural practices, and the political economy of global health. She has a not so new book called HIV Exceptionalism Development Disease Through Disease in Sierra Leone, which you should all read. Um, and it's an ethnographic account of how HIV exceptionalism, the idea that AIDS is an exceptional disease requiring an exceptional response, has had sort of untoward effects and, and, and unforeseen consequences. Um, Adia has written quite a lot about the Ebola epidemic uh, as it was unfolding in West Africa and um, Ebola. Uh, Adia. Adia. Thank you. Um, so, as Greg mentioned, I've um, worked in Sierra Leone, and that was actually quite a long time ago now that I'm thinking about it. But um, my focus has long been, um, since 2000, on public health and, and health systems. And my um, interest as an anthropologist, it's not exactly an anthropological thing, right? When you hear anthropology, you think of people who understand exotic cultural practices of the local people. Um, in fact, <clears throat> I'm interested in those things, but my locality happen to be the tribes of global health and of non-governmental organizations. How do we understand the culture, cultures of institutions and how do we embed those in, or how do we understand the histories that produce the kinds of relationships that NGOs engender, foster, and reproduce? Um, my um, experience has been one, um, during this Ebola epidemic, I've had to rethink how we talk about institutions. Do we talk about them in light of um, broader historical patterns like the enslavement of people from this region, like the Mono River region, right? How did those histories impact um, how we interpret resource extraction, um, corporate agriculture, and, mi and mining practices. Um, many of you know that Liberia has Firestone, uh, which is a rubber 
plantation <laughs> that has a long history of collusion with uh, oppressive, I, I feel like, gosh, I feel so radical now. <laughs> <laughs> like oppression and, and all, I use the word oppression twice. So, but, but, but um, then we can talk about this more, but how do we understand what's happening within a broader uh, historical context? How do we understand the cultures of institutions, the practices in which they engage, and how these have shaped health systems um, how they've shaped humanitarian assistance, right? So who, who comes to help and who gets flown out when Ebola gets too hard, right? This is a question that I've asked in my writing. Um, you, Francisco, you left, right? Yes. Um, you were evacuated because we were worried that you were going to get sick or you know things like that. So what this revealed for me as a person who studies institutional cultures was how lives matter in, in the practice of humanitarian assistance but also how these things shaped health systems to begin with. As Francisco mentioned, IMF and, and World Bank have had a great impact on budgets, but a, a civil war also did, right? Civil war made it possible for people to think of Sierra Leone and Liberia and Guinea to some extent as blank slates. Those blank slates, you know, are, th those are fictions. There was social life before, during, and after war. But when you think of a place as, as being a blank slate, blank slate how, do, how do systems get built up? Who dictates the shape, the cultures, um, the expansiveness of those institutions, the effectiveness of those institutions? So we have to talk about who, who funds medical schools, who funds public health schools. Um, if you look at the numbers of doctors in Liberia and Sierra Leone, you will learn that, they, that there were very few clinicians um, working. Um, Guinean physicians were trained by Cubans, or <laughs> you know, Cubans were also uh, um, working in, in all of these places. So how do we understand the political economy of clinical care? I'll leave it there because I think we'll have more questions coming. So our next speaker is Turner Ba, and he's an advocate for global education and a champion for girls. And he's now at the Population Council where he leads their work on post-emergency programs for adolescent girls in Sierra Leone. Um, before joining the POP Council, he was a youth engagement coordinator at a World for School, a global cam campaign that ensures that all children have the opportunity to thrive and learn, which he co-founded in 2013. Um, at the age of 15, following years of civil war in Sierra Leone, Chenor founded and led the Children's Forums Network. Um, Chenor? Thank you very much. Um, it's great to be here. Great to see all of you here. I was just going to say how hard it is to follow that. That sounded very deep compared to um, the stories that I'm about to tell you. Um, so as Greg said in the introduction, I was busy minding my business here in the United States, working in New York on global education. Um, what I'm passionate about is to get every kid everywhere into school and learning. I work with the United Nations system. I co-founded a global organization, working with young people around the world. I was involved um, um, in, in the advocacy area, uh, immediately after Malala was shot, and, and I've been very, very involved in, in, in everything leading up to her winning the Nobel Peace Prize, including introducing her when she gave her big speech at the UN. But I'm from Sierra Leone, and I was born and raised there. I was a refugee in Guinea for a while, and then I went to, I worked in Liberia, um, after the war there, helping to the youth programs for the UN. So I know the three countries pretty well. And the first thing I will say is, in many ways, and it builds on the two points that you've just made, the, prop, the reason why Ebola got to where it got was because it found a perfect host. Here was a set of countries, you know, the theory about the blank slates, the fact that there was no uh, or barely any structures that existed. The human capacity itself in these countries was very limited. The three countries combined account for the lowest illiteracy rates in the world, adult illiteracy rates in the world. Um, and you know, because of the war, because of everything that had happened, we were just beginning to build structures and institutions when Ebola hit. So how did I get involved? I, I, I was here and, and started hearing all of these stories and in September and I thought to myself, well, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a humanitarian, I've, I've worked in emergencies, and I want to go back and see particularly, one of my passions is around girls' education, how this was affecting girls. Because I was hearing in the immediate aftermath, uh, 
the response is very few people were talking about the human effect of this. Not only the people who are getting infected, but the people who are getting affected by all of this. Those people that were not being evacuated, but whole towns and districts were being shut down. They quarantined whole communities, for example, and neighborhoods. And so I raised some money here in, in, uh, in the US and I went out to do some, um, some distribution, but also to help tell the story. Um, and I went to Potloko, which is still the most affected district in the country. My father lived in Kenema and I went out there. And one of the things that really shocked me in my experience, uh, when, and I've been four times now, I just came back again in, in April and, and I've switched my job from focusing on global education to really trying to focus on dealing with the aftermath of the Ebola response because as most of you will know, um, the cameras have left. Well, just yesterday, Sierra Leone had three cases, but you don't hear that anymore in the news. Uh, we still have a number of people who are still in hospitals and still affecting us. But one of the things that shocked me was just the fact that the, the, lack, of, uh, the lack of any um, coordinated response to what was going on. It was so haphazard. It was the government didn't know what to do. The president took so long to declare it an emergency, WHO. You know, the UN system is fantastic, and I work within the system, so I love it. They created the Ebola response in Ghana. Uh, the headquarters for the UN structure that was created, they placed that in Accra, Ghana, and it was supposed to coordinate everything that was happening in the country. And the president appointed a new coordinator of Ebola and then kept the Ministry of Health separate. So you had the UN response, you had the Ministry of Health, you had WHO, you had everything else going on, and it was a complete chaos. Uh, so that, that, first of all, kind of took me aback, and I think it goes back to the fact that there was not... And then the, 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 the human element of it, uh, girls, the, the uh, and education. I looked at the, the UN response, everything that they had called for, and the word education barely even featured. And here we were already close to a whole academic year, where nobody had gone to school. And I work in education. I know when kids stay out of school for a year, it's two times less likely that, that they, they're not going to come back to school. And particularly for girls, I know that, um, you know, because of, and I, and, I, and I talk about this a lot, because of the quarantines, because we were all, people were home, nobody was moving, actually, sexual activity went up. And some people are surprised by this. It didn't go down, because people are not going to stop having sex. Actually, they're going to have more. Uh, and reproductive health services in the country, which the baseline before Ebola was about 10% access to modern contraceptives. I talked to Mary Stopes, and they were, in some cases, down by 90%, in some cases, down by 100%. So you had a baseline of, of 10%, now down by 90%. So you had what was, in essence, the beginning of an even major epidemic that we were not even talking about. I work with, uh, 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 and I helped found a group, a coalition in Sierra Leone of NGOs who are working on adolescent girls' issues. Some of them are providing support for uh, victims of fistula. And the government said, if you have a program that was not responding directly to Ebola, you have to close it. So girls and young women who had fistula were sent back home to their communities. And there was no support initially. So, in the complete chaos and the complete uh, kind of a little bit mirrors some of the reaction that you had here in the US as well, right? People were thinking with their hearts and not with their head anymore, and with fear and, and less with reason. Um, and then, and then uh, for me, as I said, the other thing was just what was happening to young girls who were in these households. Pregnancy had gone up. We did a little bit of a quick study in some towns, and we saw that. Um, you know, I talk to young girls, and most of them will tell me what they're most afraid of was, you know, their uncles. You know, for those of you who have been to Sierra Leone, we live in crowded households, particularly the poor people, right? So when nothing happens, economic activity is not happening, nothing is happening, what happens is you then have basically predatory uh, hotspots, right? Because everybody's home, and all the people who are supposed to take advantage of you are out there, and they have nothing that they're doing. Um, so all of these things contributed, and, and these are the things that this country has to deal with now going forward. The fact that schools have reopened, 
But the 3,000 girls that were pregnant, well, this is, again, a very conservative number, have been told if you're pregnant, you cannot go back to school. That's one fight we're, beginning, we're having now in the country. Because if you're pregnant, it's somehow your fault. Despite everything I've just said, you know, it's the girl's fault. And secondly, um, as I've said, the, the, uh, the education infrastructure in the country, teachers left. My mom is a teacher. She left and she's back now in Sierra Leone. But a good number of them will never return to the country. So what I, what I wanted to give voice to was that beyond the anger, the fear, beyond the immediacy of somebody's going to die of Ebola, what really this showed, and, and back to the point where I said it found a perfect host, was there was a lack of human capacity. There was a lack of the kind of investment in education and in health systems. And the response has mirrored that. And unfortunately, it's going to leave these countries worse off than where we are. And as I said, it's the, the, the real image of that is that I bet a good number of you didn't know that last week in Sierra Leone, we had 11 cases of Ebola and that people are still dying. In, but it's no longer in the news. And the attention span has left. But it's, it's what's gonna, what we're going to continue to deal with. Thanks, Junior. So our last panel to speak is Ashoka Mukpo. It's interesting, everybody's bios I took from their websites, and Ashoka's is the shortest and the most, uh, in, well, you'll hear. Ashoka is a writer and advocate who spent two years working with a Liberian advocacy group that organizes communities to demand fair treatment by foreign investors. He had a little run-in with Ebola virus last fall, and I'll live to tell about it. So. Just a little bit. Well, thanks, Greg. Uh, I think the first thing to understand is that we can't see the Ebola outbreak as only a health crisis. In a lot of ways, it was actually a crisis of state-citizen relations. So one of the things that I think surprised people so much was this Ebola denial that happened. So you saw people in West Africa who felt like this is a hoax and, uh, you know, who do we trust? We're not going to adopt the preventative measures that can keep us safe. And a lot of people in the West didn't understand why this was happening. We felt like, uh, you know, there was this idea of, well, is it lack of education or superstition or a lot of these uh, stereotypes about Africa. But actually, if you know these countries pretty well, you'd understand that their relationship with their government has typically not been very good. So, you know, if you look at Liberian history, there's a lot of exploitation. There's exploitation by systems of government. There's exploitation by the international community, uh, colonial extractivism, which Adia mentioned a little bit, and big power politics, Cold War, those kind of things. So the you know, global economy that Liberia is a part of, it works really well for some people, mainly the elites in Monrovia. But for most of the rest of the people, it's not working. People feel like government structures aren't responsive to them, they're essentially ignored by investors. And this, I think, really fueled the Ebola crisis. So for us only to look at it in health terms, I think we're going to miss some of the actual social dynamics and political dynamics that made it worse. Uh, on paper, the government is doing everything the West wants. In some sense, Liberia is kind of a test case of what we might call neoliberal development philosophies. They're, they emphasize investment, uh, they facilitate a good business climate, and there's a lot of money that's put into things like policing. From a ground-up perspective, what people actually see is corruption. They feel like they can't access justice. Uh, there's a lot of police harassment. Services are bad. And unless you have money, you can't get a fair shake in trial and those kind of things. So, you know, I think that the crisis didn't have to be as bad as it was. If people had been more responsive to the government and more responsive to warnings, uh, it's likely that the outbreak would have actually ended pretty quickly. So what are the lessons of that and how does international aid figure into it? I think with my experience working in Liberia, you see that the aid community tends to work from a government perspective. You know, they support the government, they give them money, they listen to what they have to say and what people themselves actually feel about how the development of their society is happening, it's not that important to them. And you know, that kind of philosophy, I think, dominates what we might call peace building and, and peacekeeping. And it's not working. And I think that you know, it took the Ebola crisis for anybody who really is an observer of these countries to see just how mistrusted the government is. But moving forward, if you want to you know, maintain peace and you want to ensure that Liberians, and you know, I can't speak to Sierra Leone and Guinea. I'm not actually super familiar with those places, but 
in Liberia particularly, if you, know, you want to support a country that people feel like they're a part of and that they feel proud to be in, you need to start listening to them better. And I think that the aid community has responsibility in this because they, their support, financial and political, for the government has sort of allowed the government to marginalize and not listen to the voices of people themselves. And I think now there's a bit of a push to just go back to the status quo. So, okay, Ebola is done, in Liberia at least. I know there's still you know, problems in other places, but people feel like, okay, now that we got this out of the way, let's just go back to the way things were. And I think that that would be a, a pretty significant mistake. So we have to really look at the politics of the situation and start to listen to people and see how the state building process can be done better. Thanks, Ashoka. So I have a few questions, and then if you guys want to chime in with questions of each other, that's fine too. So one of the themes coming up here, and you've all sort of touched upon it, is sort of how sort of political and economic policies sort of pave the path for Ebola to sort of um, break out in, in these three countries, and, and some, somehow that neoliberal development policies uh, had a part to play in this. There have been people like Chris Blattman at Columbia who used to teach here at Yale in the political science department who pushed back on that and said, this is research at a distance. Um, and that, you know, it's very nice for progressive lefties to think that, you know, the IMF and the World Bank are at the root of all evil, but, you know, you don't have the evidence to show that that's true. Um, would any of you like to sort of take on Chris? <laughs> <laughs> I always like to take on Chris. Um, <laughs> as you might know. Uh, well, I wonder if it, well, so, so there was actually quite a lot of, of back and forth with Chris Blattman on this. Um, and in fact, um, Kim Yi, Dion, and I wrote a response because I think what, he, he always asked for evidence, but I think he, has, he also has very little evidence to prove that it doesn't have an impact. What we do know is that World Bank and IMF are not simply about setting economic policy or, 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 or controlling purse strings, so to speak, but they're also responsible for promoting a certain kind of ideology, right? A, per, a, a particular stance towards how to finance uh, state-sponsored services, right? So even if even if they're not explicitly, you know, holding a gun to someone's head or, or whatever and saying you can't spend this much on, on health or education, which they kind of actually do, um, they, they, they have promoted, as Ashoka mentioned and as Cherno and, and, and Francisco have also mentioned, they also, they do promote a, a neoliberal ideology which is focused on, um, on cutting spending for social services, improving military, I mean, especially in a post-conflict setting, improving sort of militarization and policing um, to a certain extent and, and privatizing those things, mm -hmm. privatizing social services in the forms of NGO, in the NGO works, right? So there are many ways in which these ideologies suffuse um, political and social practices. Um, so, you know, well, yes, of course, IMF and, and World Bank are not saying you must do this. Again, they are. <laughs> but they, they, they're, but they, they're also, they also have espoused a certain way of thinking about the world, of ordering the world, and, 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 and what constitutes ethical practice from an economic and political perspective. And I think that's the problem that, that, we, that, we're, that Blattman doesn't address, right? right. If I could just kind of add to that, uh, <laughs> just as a little anecdote. Um, when I first got to Liberia, I was doing a consultancy with the UN mission there, UNMIL. And our uh, job was to look at foreign investors and how they were treating rural communities, you know, what the conflict dynamics around oil palm and mining and those kind of things were. So we spent three months studying this, and then we went to the special representative of the Secretary General, who's the chief of the UN mission, and had our findings. And we presented them to her and said, look, the government is you know, doing things poorly. There's a lot of conflicts here and people are being mistreated. And her response to this was, you know, that's great, you guys did a good job, but we would appreciate it that since we finance this research that you don't put the report out until the elections are over. So that kind of thing, it's, you know, it might not be a, a direct, we're telling people what to do, but as long as, you know, policies that are seen as appropriate are being carried out by the government, then they get support 
they, you know, people will try not to release negative information about them and those kind of things. So I don't think it's quite as simple as just the IMF tells you what to do. There's a whole structure out there that's set up to support certain kinds of state behavior, certain governance practices, and if you step out of line of that, there are consequences. And they might not be as straightforward as a loan getting pulled, but you'll feel them nonetheless. Thanks. So I want to take it from the political down to the, the personal a little bit. And um, I want to ask the two of you sort of related questions. One is for you, Ashok, to tell me, you wrote about Shaki Kamara and talk a little bit about mm -hmm. him. Sure. Um, and then I'll go on. Okay. So Shaki Kamara was a 15-year-old boy who lived in a neighborhood in Monrovia called West Point. And West Point has a long history that you could do a whole panel on. It's a, you know, has a really kind of important role in Monrovian society and Liberian culture. And West Pointers are among probably the most mistreated of Liberians. They're considered to be criminals. It's sort of like, that's the element. They're the poor people. You know, they're just a hassle. So when that Ebola denial first started happening in West Point, the government's response to it was very militarized, like Adi was saying. They sent troops in, they quarantined. Uh, there was a break-in at a holding center. You know, people didn't think it was real, so they released a bunch of Ebola patients. And the government's response to that is, let's send the military in. And of course, you know, you wake up and life is already hard enough for you as it is. You have to find a way to go make money on a daily basis. You're going into the city to sell goods or, you know, engage in various kinds of economic activities. And when you see a police barricade, most people's first response is, fuck this, I'm going to work. And uh, the military actually opened fire on people. And they wound up killing a 15 year old kid named Shaki Kamara. So I think he was really a symbol for me of this sort of authoritarian approach towards dealing with problems that I really saw in Liberia for years. You know, if there was a protest at a mining site or a palm oil plantation, the first impulse is there's send a you know paramilitary police outfit to go and take care of that. And what's interesting is West Point actually had the first major reduction in cases of Monrovia. But it was achieved because there was a couple of really smart people in the Ministry of Health that said, this approach isn't right. We need to go in and talk to these people. So they went in and they said, look, what can you guys do that can help find these sick people, that can keep your community safe, and we'll just support you. We're not going to tell you what to do. We're just going to support what you want to do. So it's sad that this kid had to lose his life for this. You know, it's th that approach would have made sense to have adopted right at the beginning, but unfortunately, it took, you know, the death of this kid to make that happen. So, you know, so a, a lot of people who read about the Ebola epidemic heard about the heroism of American healthcare workers, <laughs> and then you'd hear about the heroism of local healthcare workers, rightly so. Um, you know, you've written about how young women and girls were at the heart of the response to Ebola, and nobody really actually talks about it. Could you talk a little bit about how you see that having yeah. played out? No. Yes. Yeah, so when I went to Sierra Leone, one of the things that was becoming particularly evident in, in the rural communities was that girls and young women were taking over responsibility for the families, um, especially families where uh, people had died of or survived Ebola. So typically, um, the way that the, um, you know, in, in most families, so it's the people who have the most mobility that actually are more likely to get infected. And the people with the most mobility, typically, you know, if it's the woman in the household who has to go out and do something, or the dad. So what was happening was a good number of people who were dying, and, and also a good number of people who were dying of Ebola were typically the primary caregivers in the homes, in the households. So the dad and the mom I met a number of folks. And I went to a, a number of uh, Ebola um, ceremonies where uh, survival ceremony. So when, when people survived, they had this huge ceremony to try to really tell communities that if you come in early, you will, you will survive. And I realized there was a bit of a pattern in that. The young girls, their stories were always about how they got infected was because they had to take care of the people in their household. So when somebody got sick, the young lady had to take care of her mom. She's the one that carried her mom on her back. Her mom was, uh, I met this particular young girl whose mom was a nurse and the mom died, the father died, every other member in her family died. Now she was the oldest, she was 16. She had to take care now of about seven other younger siblings in her family, including extended family members. 
And I began to see this pattern, not only of girls, but also of young women who all of a sudden now are taking care of their, their families. And, but the, the saddest part was the lack of any, as you say, recognition and support system for, for these people. Again, the way that um, services are rendered into, into communities like this, the NGO approach, the kind of government approach, is the head of the household they're looking for the guy, they're looking for the father or the male head of the household. They go into communities, they give the chief the supplies. And the young girl who actually has a primary responsibility, who's taking care of the siblings, who's now taken over these additional responsibilities, either doesn't get anything, or if she's an Ebola survivor, they give them $10. They give them $10. So when, you, when you're infected, you know, they burn, they burn all their personal belongings. You didn't have to go through that. Oh, I did. Oh, you did? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, so they burn all their personal belongings. Um, you know, and in this case, for, for most of the young girl survivors, their families as well, so the elder people in their families, who, for some reason, those of you who are scientists will be able to speak more about this than me, but it seems as if the younger you are, the less likely you are to survive. Um, um, uh, the, so, you know, if their parents die, because the older people as well were much more in denial, because they, you know, like her mom was like, a, she believed in God, she kept, even if she was a nurse, she believed in God. But so, they, when they send them home, they give them a bag of rice and $10. And, you know, in five days, that's over because she has to take care of her family and then she's got nothing. And then there was no educational support. It's only now that when they're talking about post Ebola, they're beginning to ask questions about, oh, what are we going to do about these Ebola survivors? So I think it's um, part of why we got to where we got to in the first place was these very women and young girls are less likely to be educated, less likely to have access to science-based information because of the way the structure is. And, and they don't have access to information that they trust as well, because the whole community was always <coughs> inundated with so much gossip and misinformation. And I like to tell my American audiences that if you're American, you can be proud or sad because most people blamed the Americans. I don't know how they managed to get to, it was Americans' fault that Ebola is in West Africa. But this was the widespread belief that everybody thought it was the Americans who were doing some, um, some experiments. They thought that it was some lab testing that had gone wrong because they don't trust their government. And as you say, this whole people believe that they are blank slates. They believe that our government are capable of selling us. They're capable in exchange for money or corruption. They're capable of putting their people in harm's way. And frankly, um, the history of American and Western governments as well in dealing with these people make their first reaction as well as one of suspicion. So I think all of those things made, made, made the, the outbreak work, you know, as bad as it became. And as I said, the young women and young girls, and in Liberia particularly as well, it was girls' organizations and women's organizations that went door to door talking to people that were helping as well to raise awareness about this. But as you said, that's something that's not talked about. So uh, jumping off of that, I want to ask Francisco and Adia a couple of questions. So I'm an epidemiologist, and I think of I think quantitatively, and I think of microbes and things like that. And Ebola is a zoonotic disease, meaning it jumps from animals into human hosts. Uh, and Francisco, you've written a little bit about in your piece about the politics and economics of zoonotic disease. And you talked a little bit about it in your opening comments, but I wonder if you could sort of explain it more about how you see sort of zoonoses having sort of a political uh, aspect, an economic aspect. Yeah, I mean, this was one of the things that really, um, you know, I hadn't thought much about until faced with the Ebola crisis. I'm not an epidemiologist. I didn't even know what zoonotic disease meant until I was confronted with a serious epidemic of one. And, you know, what, in looking into it, you really, I mean, this is why I mentioned sort of the environmental piece um, that isn't, I feel like, being commented enough on, which is, you know, there's a reason, you know, these diseases jump from human beings, from animals to human beings through greater contact. Um, so, so I don't know, if, you know, at the beginning of the, of the epidemic, there was a lot of um, fear, paranoia around bushmeat. Um, there was the infamous Time magazine yes. cover, <laughs> right? Which, you know, and, and, and initially, you know, when, when, when Ebola first came out, the first thing they told us was, stop shaking hands, stop eating bushmeat. Um, you know, we still to this day don't know what animal actually carries yeah. Ebola. We, we, we're not entirely clear what the host is. What we do know, however, is the more contact we create, the more 
the deeper we cut into the forest, the more we, we disrupt um, these habitats, the more we're gonna see diseases like this, the more we're gonna see more diseases make that leap from whatever animal is carrying them to human beings. Um, and, and that is entirely tied to the political economy of the region. All of these are countries that are, you know, because of where they're inserted in sort of global division of labor, their primary, you know, um, commodity exporters, these, these are company, these are places where, you know, the biggest exports for a place like Sierra Leone are iron ore, rutile, diamonds, and, and palm oil. You know, with maybe some coffee and cocoa thrown in there. And you're seeing a lot of foreign companies come in and, and establish, you know, you already have it, you, you, and you have that historical legacy. You have the massive Firestone Plantation, for example, in Liberia. Um, and, you know, all, all of these are ways where, where you're getting more and more people digging deeper into the forest, cutting down trees, being in places where a lot of times, like I said, human beings haven't even been before because there have been certain taboos around protecting forests. And you know, this is also tied to the legacy of war and population movements in, 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 in the Guinea Highlands, for example. Um, but this is, I feel like, one of the key aspects that, that needs to be discussed is, you know, we have this neoliberal development model, which is very much based on the extraction of resources and, and intensive corporate agriculture. And, it, and it, you know, it, it very much harms the ecology of the region. And this is one of the direct consequences is epidemics like Ebola. So Dia, I'm not gonna ask you about the Newsweek cover <laughs> um, because I just, it just made me crazy and I don't wanna talk about it. But you, you've written something that goes to this issue about trust and about how governments relate to their, their citizens. And you wrote a piece where you talked about how leaders in West Africa have been more focused on not exporting Ebola than on curing it within their borders. And when I read that, I was just like, whoa. I mean, it just, it, it was a provocative thing to say, but it fit, as you listen to this conversation developing here, it doesn't sound so provocative at all, actually. It doesn't sound nearly as crazy. Oh, I think that was a, that was written in anger. Um, after Ellen John that was after Ellen Johnson Sirleaf was on Canadian television and she expressed anger at Thomas Eric Duncan for spreading the oh, yeah. to the Americans. Yeah, she that. said they've been doing so much for us. How yeah. dare he? When he comes back, we're gonna talk to the lawyers and we're gonna handle him. Yeah. Right? This is something that she said to the Canadian and I assume other North American audiences who have access to Canadian television. In the same week, um, Paul Caroma <laughs> said Similar, he actually hit the, his communications unit issued a press release upon Raj Shah's visit saying, We will not export Ebola to Americans. But he assured the USAID director of this. It seemed like a strange thing to say. I mean, I know you have to say such things, but it seemed to me to be uh, those, those two sentiments as they were expressed seemed to highlight these leaders concerned with us and not with the people who are getting, falling ill and getting sick within the borders. Um, and so I called upon one of the ancestors, Malcolm X, who said, who, who said, what's the matter, boss? Are we sick? When he was trying to uh, describe the, the slave mentality, you know, the, the house Negro versus the, the, the field Negro's mentality about, um, uh, I guess, sympathetic identification with the elites, right? Um, and so this angered me for a bunch of reasons. I think it highlights some of the one-sided relationships of, of power that shape the, these leaders' responses, both public and private, and public and, and local um, responses to the disease. What, what does it say about them if they feel it's necessary to express their sympathy and care for us? And they don't feel the same need to have to do that. I think it reflects a kind of power dynamic that also shapes um, what is possible, but also reflects, um, or at least explains why <laughs> Sierra Leoneans, Liberians, and forest forestiers in uh, Guinea might not trust their governments. Um, that said, I also wanted to add a little bit of something about the Americans as a source. Um, one of the ways I saw that is, <laughs> If MSF works everywhere in the world and they're the only ones who've seen Ebola in East Africa or Central Africa, they come to West Africa, of course they brought it with them. <laughs> right? yeah, that, we always eat bush. Man. Exactly, no. we've always eaten no. it, right? And so there's that piece, but there's also the fact that Tulane did have, and the yeah. Department of Defense did have a lab in, in Kenema, yeah. where I worked, yeah. um, that did 
hemorrhagic fever work, yep. right? And and that was one of the that's actually one of the the um, that's where most expertise on loss of fever and certain kinds of hemorrhagic fevers exists in that lab. And so, what is it that they're doing in this lab? Are they only looking at that was immediately fish? closed right. as <laughs> soon as the outbreak started? Right. They right. had to close it, and there was some controversy and around around right. that. So there were questions. That right. People, are you right? Yeah. Why are they there? Who are they experimenting on? I had a couple of I had you know I had friends who died and friends who came close to dying of loss of fever. And in fact, in the refugee camps, the Liberian refugee camps in Sierra Leone, there were massive loss of fever campaigns. So I was very familiar with. Um, that disease, but also all the lab work being done. And so it was very easy for people to see how Americans, um, fund, American scientists funded by the Department of Defense, or the State Department, um, I can't remember, I think it might have been both, um, how that might have been mis or understood as U.S. government having a particular role in the spread of Ebola um, from that region, right? Um, I think it was, um, Fode Bati, who talks about how the path of Ebola followed the path of the RUF, um, right from Kailan, yeah. from Kailan through Kinema and, and, and so on. And so um, it's really interesting to think about how those same pathways have a historical, or, or are part of a historical patterning of other kinds of movements, right? So pathogens, zoonoses, zoonotic pathogens, and, and so on kind of move along the path of, of war and, and unrest. Um, just leave it here. So I wanted to give you guys the chance to um, if you have any questions of each other, um, because I don't think you've all been on the same stage before. Um, yeah, I had one question, which is, you know, we, we all saw, um, you know, the sort of terrible forecast about what was going to happen and that we would have a million cases and people were, you know, it was going to be a catastrophe and doom. And luckily we've been able to, you know, we still had a huge loss of life and, it, and it's, the disease is still not over, but, you know, we were able to kind of turn the corner um, and you know, in, in, in Liberia, the, the epidemic has been declared over. So, you know, what what do you attribute the drop in cases to? Well, we kind of talk about it, right? The difference between Sierra Leone and Liberia. What do what you go first? What do you think? Yeah, I did a little bit of uh, research on this when I was in Liberia last time, and I think a lot of it was just you had a combination of community-grown initiatives. You know, there was this initial denial that everybody said, "Well, this thing isn't real. The government's lying to us." And then when they saw their neighbors and friends dying and actually realized that they were at risk, they did what librarians have always done. They had to deal with the problem on their own without help for the most part. And, you know, they set up things like neighborhood watches that would go out and look door to door for people who were sick. And I talked with a couple of people who ran these, these groups. And eventually the Ministry of Health kicked in and started giving them a little bit of financing and there was some partnerships and they would go to places where people were sick and they would say, what are your symptoms? You have to go to a clinic. And people would say, you know, no, I don't want to. I'll just take some antibiotics. I'll be fine. They'd say, no, you have to go. We're going to stand here and talk to you until we can get you to call an ambulance. So that, I think, was much more effective than what a lot of people I've talked to think, which is that like MSF came in and saved the day, or you know the U.S. military and Operation United Assistance, or whatever it was, like came and shot Ebola to death, or something like that. <laughs> and actually, it, it, I think that it was people banded together, and they realized that they were under threat, and they found ways to keep themselves safe. And but I'm curious, why didn't that happen in Sierra Leone as well? Well, my my first <clears throat> comment will be that. Um, the the predictions were misguided because they were they were like the general reactions as well just based on kind of fair and not really based on science i think so people were, everybody was so scared and thought oh my god if it's already moved this bit that means it's going to take over the entire city and everybody's going to die i think it didn't account for some of these structures and and these community structures and things like that now i i think that as you said earlier on, Ebola is actually not that hard to control once people know what to do. I think once it's, when people begin to understand what to do, I think in the case of Liberia and Sierra Leone as well, when I was there in January, was there were more beds than patients. That was a big, that was massive, massive help. When people knew they could go to the hospital and they can come back home, I think actually the Americans <coughs> did help by, by constructing those beds in Liberia pretty fast when the military showed up and they had these images of constructing all these tents and, and people knew that they can now get sick, they could go to the hospital and they could get treated. In Sierra Leone, for the most part, we were chasing 
um, we, were, we were behind. So there were still more sick people than beds for until like January, February. That's when we were having 100 cases a day. And the, the British set up their own system in Sierra Leone. And they, they spent a lot of money and built a hospital and they said only British people are welcome to get there. So there was all this uh, scandal. I don't know if yeah. you read about yeah. it. Um, so what happened was when people went to the hospital, either they send them back home, or if they died on their way to the hospital, they will bury them in place. And it's in Sierra Leone, it's actually a much more bigger cultural significance. People were much more afraid of what happens to them when they die, how are they going to treat them when they die, the way we treat our dead. It's a, it's a reflection of who we are. It's actually the most, it's the biggest honor you can give somebody. It's the way you treat them when they die. And Ebola came and basically just flipped the entire narrative of that. One, we can't hold each other. This is who we are. The first thing we do is want to hug each other. When somebody's sick, you want to touch them. You can't do that. And then when they die, worst of all, is they are buried in places you might never even know. So I think that the, the response the Americans and the support the librarians got was better than in Sierra Leone. And Liberia has a better history of these civil groups. If, you, if you've seen the movie Pray the Devil Back to Hell with Lee McBowie and others, Liberia has a much more, I think, a stronger social structure compared to Sierra Leone. And this structure was, they were um, mobilized and quickly kind of empowered. And that did not happen in Sierra Leone. In Sierra Leone instead, a lot of the support was still going towards the government and they gave like the parliamentarians one million, whatever, uh, millions of leons each and things like that. So that did not help at all. So I think part of the problem is actually the difference in the way that we responded to it. And I think there's a little bit of politics as well around the difference there. Can I um, add one thing? It, uh, that was great. Because everyone always asks me that. The people who work in Guinea are like, how did Liberia do this? <laughs> but, but, I, but one of the things I wanted to say is, um, as a result of this um, outbreak, I started talking to modelers. Right, so the, the, epi the, the people who actually build the models, right? I, I actually, that's part of my study. I said, oh, how, do you guys, how did you guys actually come up with those figures? Yeah. Um, and I would say, I, I, I'm, as an ethnographer, I'm very concerned or interested in how knowledge is produced. And I would say that they all had their best intentions. They weren't actually as fearful, as, fearful as they wanted to, they did want to make a statement, a political statement to garner support, but they were also contested about which numbers matter, right? So uh, CDC added a correction factor, this is going to be sort of boring for some of you, CDC added a, a correction factor of 2.5 because they felt like underporting was, there was so much underreporting, um, which, which made those figures b blow up to 1 million. Um, but this was also contested. On Twitter, all of the modelers were like, wait, but why 2.5? Why not 2.7 or 3.6? Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so there, I mean, obviously, um, the one thing that I would say about modelers and, and the culture of modeling is that the, it's more important to get the assumptions right, to tell everyone your assumptions for reproducibility than it is to actually be right about what the figure might be. <laughs> um, and, and they were trying to strike a balance between what will get people to actually act and what, and what um, that's the first thing they're interested in, right? But they're also an, an interested in being able to say what looks reasonable based upon what we know in the literature, which was very limited, about the reproductive number, mm -hmm. about the um, um, transmissibility, about the incubation period. They, they did take all of those things into account, but what they discovered is they didn't know nearly as much as they thought they did about the disease. The, the figures varied um, by strain, they varied by place, they varied by, by social circumstances. And so what they found was that they, they were, and they're, they're based upon the, the fact that no one's doing anything. Yeah, people, exactly. were, people were doing things. Yeah. <laughs> and so this, they, and modelers never expect to get it right. They expect to approximate a situation on the basis of a bunch of assumptions. And once those assumptions are shattered, they have to create new models on the basis of what's out there. And usually with substandard data, and usually with data that's very much um, um, cordoned off by the powers that be. WHO did not release those data, and that was a big political issue. They only put, released the aggregated data that was really messy to begin with. Lots of it didn't add up. Um, the raw data is at University College London, and they don't want to give you any of it. So <laughs> these, these, this is actually one of the reasons that the models well, it didn't work. Anyway. No, I'm a mathematical modeler, and this is like one of the best descriptions I've heard of <laughs> why things went wrong and why things went right. Because right. so, some of the modelers were pretty close to act the actual numbers in, in different places. There's mm -hmm. 
there's a PhD student at MIT named Maya Majumder, yeah. um, Maya. who's written actually about the sort of competing models for what was going to happen in the Ebola epidemic. Now we're going into sort of <laughs> epidemiology <laughs> land, which I did not want to do. Um, so, so we are completely out of time. Um, and whether it's a moral responsibility uh, or a political one, you know, there's a labor organizer who wants to don't mourn, organize, right? And there is a way out, and it's about organizing and people from the grassroots organizing on their own behalf to, to, to make a difference in this world. So I, I think we can leave this panel with hope, um, but it's not going to be easy, but we need to organize and, and push back for global health equity so that epidemics uh, don't happen like this again in Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and elsewhere around the world. So thanks for coming, everybody. Thank